Hello everybody, this is Danny from Deep South Homestead uh, Gardening 101 today. I uh, want to talk to y'all about, we've already talked about preparing the soil and some of the other videos and getting ready for uh, doing our gardening, pHs and stuff like that. I'm going to talk about tomatoes today. Uh, I, picked a, I picked tomatoes because it seems to be the one that everybody wants to plant some of. And guys, the things that I'm going to talk about today, now I don't go and look at a bunch of university research study stuff and all that. I feel like if I go online and look at all this stuff and just read it and I talk to y'all, all I'm doing is repeating stuff that, that somebody else has done. So the things that I talk about are things that I've tried. It's things that I know works for me. Um, it may go against the grain of some of the studies that's out there. I don't know. All I know is I talk about what I do and what works for me here at Deep South Homestead. Now to start out with, we want to make sure that we start our seeds. Now, some people just buy plants, and if you buy plants from a nursery, that's perfectly fine. But here at Deep South Homestead, we start ours from seeds if we can, if at all possible. And when we do, we like to start with a sterilized seeding mix. Now, we usually will pick up some in town. If not, we'll make our own. It just depends on the situation at the time. Uh, but usually it's not a hard thing. We start off in very small pots because we can get more plants because we plant so many. It's not really worth it to us to try to put tiny seeds in big containers uh, in the beginning stages. So we start with the seed trays and the little one by one seed trays. We put two seeds in each one, you know, cover them lightly and we water them in, put a cover over the top of them and we just basically wait for them to sprout. Now, once they come up, we give them to they're about to the, uh, I usually wait till they're around the four and five leaf stage and they're at least three inches tall. And I'll take something like a, a metal spoon is what I found to be best to scoop the little tomato plants out of the little one by one things with a little spoon. But now what you want to do, let me make, let me make this perfectly clear, is the evening before you plan to transplant, go out and water it real good. Because what that'll do is that that'll make the next day when you go to take those plants out, that'll make that soil bind to those roots and it won't be falling off the roots because from my experience, once soil falls off the roots of the tomato plants, it's very difficult to get them to ever do like what they should do. So if you'll wet the soil the evening before and get up the next morning and scoop these little plants out of the little containers that they're in there, the plastic things, then I found that you get a lot better results that way. And what I like to do is, is when I move them, from the little one by one containers up to the uh, larger containers. Now what I do, I'll tell y'all to save money. I just go to the grocery store and I buy the little the red solo cups, the yellow ones or whatever color you want. I take my pocket knife and I turn the cup upside down and I make three nicks on the outside the cup around it. I cut three little slots and it holes so that the water can drain from it. And then I fill it with a good pot and soil and at this time, now, I don't add any fertilizer to the soil when I plant my seeds. Because a lot of your potting soils come with a, a minute amount of fertilizer in them, and that's perfectly okay for small seeds. Because you don't really want to, uh, you don't want too much fertilizer on a tiny seed like that, because a lot of times it can burn the roots up. But at transplant time, I will, once I put a good meat planting medium in though, like the red solo cups, I'll fill it about three quarters of the way full. And I'll take these little seedlings with a spoon and I'll just kind of scoop me a little hole down in there and I'll set them things down and I'll fill it up with dirt all the way to right about maybe a quarter of an inch from the bottom of the bottom leaves on them, and which puts about two inches of that plant down into that solo cup. And at that time, I will use a water soluble fertilizer and break it down to about one quarter of what they say to mix it. And I'll, I'll wet the cup. And then what I do is I have trays that uh, I go to Walmart and buy these little Sterilite trays or clear plastic ones about four inches high on the edges. They're probably 20 something inches long and 16 inches wide. 
and I set these solo cups over in them as I transplant my tomatoes over into that. And what I'll do then is I'll take a little bit of Epsom salt, probably one tablespoon per gallon, and I'll pour a gallon of that water in the bottom of that plastic tote with those cups sitting in it. And then I'll mix up my fertilized water and I will put, like I said, one quarter of the mixture that they call for. If they call for a tablespoon per gallon or whatever, I'll do a quarter of a tablespoon per gallon and I'll pour that in there just so the water is maybe a half an inch deep up on these cups and I just leave it at that. And I don't water anymore. Um, I, I kind of just let it sit at that. And I put it in a sunny location, uh, out of direct sunlight, but yet where the sun can get to it. And if you don't have that, then you're using, you can use a fluorescent light if you want to. Just keep the fluorescent light about two to three inches above the plant at all times. Because if you don't, what happens is the plants will take off and they'll grow trying to reach that light and they end up being tall and spindly. And that's not something that I'm interested in. So um, that's how I get my plants off to a start. Now, once my the danger of all frost is passed and I've prepared my soil like we talked about in some of the other videos, I will take and um, prepare my tomato plant holes a little different than most people do. I take a post hole digger and I dig a hole in the ground probably about 18, 16 to 18 inches deep. And I take my corn cobs from the previous year. I put about four or five of them down in that hole. And I put a little bit of uh, dirt in on top of that. And then I'll put a little bit of Epsom salt on top of the dirt. And just a small amount of fertilizer on there, whatever type you want, bone meal. Uh, bone meal is good, blood meal is good. And, um, and then I'll fill the rest of the hole with a good compost and put my tomato plant down in that and, you know, plant it. Uh, but that's, that's where I start my plants at. Now, once my plants are up and going, now let me say this, if you happen to get a plant that's too, they call them leggy, that's just too tall, maybe they get to be a foot tall or something, just skinny, you can lay that, you can bury it that deep in the ground if you want, it's not going to hurt anything. Uh, but if you're in an area that kind of stays moist a lot, then you can lay that plant down on its side and kind of turn the top and come up out of the soil right below the leaves and it'll grow roots all along that plant. That's one thing about a tomato plant is it will grow roots all along the stems. Now, one of the things that you have to consider before you even start ordering your seeds or anything is varieties uh, or types. There are like two basic types of tomatoes. There's determinate and there's indeterminate. Now, determinate tomatoes are more what they call a bush tomato. Uh, the tomatoes will come on it and over a week or two time. They'll all get ripe at one time. And that way it's good for people who like to do a lot of canning. All their tomatoes can come in at one time. They can get them. It's over with. And usually you don't, they don't require a lot of staking or anything like that. But if you're one of those kind of people that likes tomatoes to, you know, you like to can, but at the same time, you want some for eating along all through the summer, then you need to go with an indeterminate variety. And when you do indeterminate varieties, you know, you have to stake them or cage them. Uh, I prefer caging for, best re uh, for the best results because there's not a lot of tying and time consumption and all that when you put them in cages. Now, I build my own cages. I don't buy them. I use concrete reinforcement wire to build them out of, uh, and it seems to work real good for that. Because the squares are big enough, you can get your hands in you know, to do any kind of pruning or to get the tomatoes out, especially if they're big tomatoes, you don't have any problem um, getting them out. And a lot of people want to know, well, I don't know how big to make the cage. I typically do, with the concrete wire, I do 10 squares. And uh, I cut it off at 10 squares. That way, that makes that thing about anywhere between 16 and 18 inches in diameter at the top, which is plenty big for a tomato plant uh, to come up through. But now here in the South, this, this may be different a little bit where you live at. A lot of people, you know, they watch me when I do my tomatoes, they get upset and they go, oh, you're pulling off all those suckers. Well, here in the deep South where I live at, because of humidity and uh, soil, -borne, soil borne diseases, we plant mainly heirlooms here. Uh, what happens is 
if you have any leaves close to the bottom of that plant as it rains it splatters water from the ground splatters up on those bottom leaves and once that plant gets up and going let's say maybe you know it's a foot tall i will come up off and pick me a sucker pretty maybe about six inches from the ground and i let that sucker grow and what i do is I end up with a plant that's forked like this it gives me two main stems coming up and then I take all the bottom leaves off of it so if it rains, nothing can really splatter up onto the leaves to get the uh, soil-borne funguses and stuff like that started, the wilts and things like that started on it. And, uh, and as an, indeter an indeterminate grows, I take all the suckers off of it. Now granted, it gives me a fewer amount of tomatoes, but I'm looking for tomatoes over a longer period of time. So therefore, I'm really not losing anything, but I get a lot larger tomatoes, a uh, lot better looking tomatoes by taking the suckers off you know, of it. Now, the thing about in, indeterminate tomatoes is, is once they, I mean, they'll grow 10, 15, up to 20 feet if you would let them. But once they get about, mine gets up to the tops of the cages a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll pinch that top sucker out of it, or the top of the plant out, and that causes it to stop growing anymore and it starts putting on good fruit and everything. Now, what I'll normally do is once mine gets fruit about the size of a quarter, let's say, starts getting tomatoes about that size, is I begin my fertilization program on a regular basis at that point. I try to I use a well-balanced mixture of fertilize. Um, you can go organic if you want. The only problem with organic fertilizers are is the, the nutritional value in them is really not consistent. And you really got to monitor that plant to know um, if you've got enough or if you don't have enough. But um, a lot of times I will just go ahead and use a, a, um, a, a fertilizer that has got the known nutrients in it up to certain percentages in it. It may not necessarily be organic. It may be a water-soluble one or whatever that um, is there. But now I'm going to give you some little secrets that I will do on my tomato plants along the way. Is once they reach that quarter quarter size, I go ahead and I put calcium in the soil. And I do put some calcium in the soil when I'm planting it. I put it down in, underneath the base of the plant, deep in the ground, so that when the roots grow into it, I usually put a half a cup in the hole when I'm putting in my fertilizer. Um, I, I did neglect to mention that. But once it starts going, um, I put a, a calcium-based um, fertilizer in the soil for the tomato plants. Now, you can get that in a lot of forms, but guys, I'm gonna just be honest with you, you can just go to the store and buy the, um, the cheap old Tums antacid tablets and dissolve them in warm water. And, and pour that water around the bottom of that tomato plant and do just about as good if you want to try to get the calcium up in it. And I, water, I fertilize every two weeks during the growing season. Now, once the tomatoes get to be a size of a quarter, I, put, I fertilize with magnesium, I fertilize with calcium, and then I put my regular fertilizer in. And I don't want anything real high in nitrogen because even though tomato plants love a lot of nitrogen, I'll usually use something that the nitrogen is a, is a less number than the, than the other two numbers on it. Because what I do is, is I'll take some blackstrap molasses, um, you can get it in any grocery store, and I'll mix like maybe one to two tablespoons per gallon of water and I'll pour it around the plants to feed them. And you'll, what you'll end up with is you'll end up with a tomato that is a lot better tasting um, than what you normally would end up with. Now, you've also got to determine some particular varieties of tomatoes. Now, they have early, mid, and late season tomatoes. Um, here in the deep, deep south, we try to go with an early season tomato because we've learned over a period of time the years that we've done this, that once that soil reaches, I mean, once the temperature, not the soil, but once the temperature of the air gets above 85 degrees consistently day after day after day, those tomatoes will just hang on the plant green for like weeks on end. So what we do at that point is go ahead and take the green tomatoes off that's large enough 
because you'll tell whenever they're starting to try to ripen they'll go from that dark green look to more of a light uh, almost whitish green look and bring them in and we'll a lot of people say wrap them in newspapers we don't do that you you can cover them with some newspapers but um or you, a lot of people say well set them in a, a sunny windowsill guys the sun uh the solar plays no part in the ripening of it it's all done with ethylene gas that that tomato gives off um so but i'll set mine in a dark cool place and just lay newspapers over them or something like that and um they ripen just fine i've never had a problem with it and there's there's lots of things like this that um that makes a tomato plant what it needs to be now you need to determine where you live at as to which tomato variety type and all that will be best for you where you live there's lots of pros and cons out there about growing tomatoes um you know some people go well where i'm at we have to grow the early ones where i'm at it's better to grow the late ones and that's something you're going to have to decide for yourself about where you live at and what works best for you there i'm just in the deep south that we don't get something in very early then what happens is we end up uh, with the blight hitting it because we'll get start getting rain and it rain day after day and the humidity gets up 98 to 100 percent all the time and and the wilt and the blights and all that's begin to set into the tomato plants and you just lose them i mean there's nothing much you can do for them when that happens now you can buy varieties hybrid varieties that are uh, that are resistant to lots of things. A fusarium wilt, a uh, verticillin wilt, uh, tobacco mosaic viruses, and, you know, nematode resistant. I mean, there's just a world of different varieties. And you, you have to decide that as a person, which one you want to do. Now, we are beginning to have tremendous amounts of problems here at our homestead with nematodes and uh, viruses and stuff like that because of atmospheric things that's going on. So we are going to be looking into some different hybrids there's nothing wrong with a hybrid i get an open pollinated hybrid um you know that there's nothing wrong with that tomato whatsoever you just can't save the seed from it and get a true variety back is basically is all that it means uh, i might not have quite as many minerals or or the quite the taste that an heirloom would have and lots of times the hybrids are bred up to have a better taste and also in choosing tomatoes you want to make sure of what you're looking for in a tomato uh, they have red tomatoes, they have pink tomatoes, they have orange tomatoes, you know what I mean? They have yellow tomatoes, they have blue tomatoes, they have black tomatoes, they have green tomatoes, they have striped tomatoes. It's all about what you're interested in because each one of them carry different characteristics with it. Now, if you're interested in one in the Indigo series, uh, that would be the, the blue tomatoes. Uh, they only turn blue when they're exposed to the sun. If they're covered up with leaves up under the plant in there and the tomatoes up under, it'll just turn a dark red, kind of orangish red tint to it. Uh, we grow several of those varieties here, the black, the, the blueberry, the, um, the apple. The, I mean, there's, um, you know, there's a, an array of them we, um, we grow here. Depending on what size tomato you want, the, the blueberries are little small one inch ones and uh, the cherry drops are like an inch and a half. I mean, you, you know, they just keep going up in size. Because of the dark blue part of them, they're loaded with anthrocyanins. They're good cancer fighters. I mean, you have to determine what you're looking for in a tomato. Now, you can't pick those until they get soft to the touch because if you pick them before then they have a bitter taste to them and they're only sweet when they get soft to the touch the the ones in the indigo series but now your colored your red tomatoes let me say is your red tomatoes are going to always be higher in acid because of their red nature if you get a uh like a, a cherokee purple tomato or even the uh the ones in the indigo series or the yellow pear tomatoes your yellow tomatoes and stuff like that are always going to be higher in sugar. So they're going to be sweeter tomatoes. So you want to determine what you're actually looking for in a tomato. Some of them are actually tartar. Some of the green ones have a more tart taste to them than, than the others do. And some of them are better for frying. Um, some of them are better for sandwiches. Some of them are better for making sauces out of your paste tomatoes and stuff like that. Your Amish paste, you know... All these different ones are better for making ketchups and um, uh, tomato sauces, um, your pastas and stuff like that that you, not your pastas, but your sauces that you mix with your pastas and stuff. 
you know, your paste tomatoes are, all, are going to be better for that because there's more meat and less juice. But if you're looking for something with a sweeter taste, you're going to want a tomato that is a colored tomato, more like a yellow or a, or a orangish color or something like that. So we can see that there's lots of different aspects of growing tomatoes. It's not just simply, I'm going to go to the store and pick me up a tomato. But if you're interested in tomatoes for salads, you know, you're going to want to get a cherry tomato. And there's just, there's probably a thousand different cherry tomato varieties out there. Uh, me personally, my, one of my favorites is a Sweet Million. Uh, it's a hybrid, but it makes so many tomatoes. And they're tiny tomatoes. Uh, you can just pop them in your mouth like popcorn, you know, and you can eat them. You don't even have to cut them up to put them in a salad. You just throw them in your mouth and eat them. Uh, I mean, there's just, like I said, there's probably a thousand varieties of cherry tomatoes out there. Um, the yellow pear tomatoes are another little small tomato. Very small, very sweet, very good in salads. Um, just loads up. I mean, tomatoes everywhere. And then there's, you know, you've got your, uh, your tree tomatoes, uh, your Belgium giants and all that stuff that grows up and they just make huge tomatoes. Some of them can be two and three pounds, uh, you know, even more than that, a lot of them. Uh, most of your heirloom tomatoes have a very irregular shape to them. They're not very consistent in shape, which makes them unpopular in the modern grocery stores. Um, most people are looking for a uniform tomato that's ripe all the way, red all the way to the stem at the top. You know, you're going to have to go with a, um, a more hybrid type variety in order to get that consistency if that's what you're looking for. Um, but there's, guys, there's probably, I don't even know how many thousand different varieties of tomato plants that there are out there for you to choose from. But there's a, you know, there's a lot of information out there about tomatoes and, and, and planting tomatoes. You have to determine, do you want to stake your tomatoes? Staking tomatoes takes a little bit more effort. But if you want to do it, I mean, you can tie them up. Not a problem. Uh, or do you want to have the cages? You can cage them. Less work. Um, do you want to buy the bush varieties, the, the determinants? There's a lot of them require no staking, but they usually have more tomatoes on them. You know, they load up real heavy, and you don't want to prune the foliage off of a determinant tomato because it, those leaves are what pulls in a lot of the sugars into those tomatoes in order to get the flavors and the taste that you're interested in them. And if you go to cutting off too many leaves on it, then you, you actually damage the plant, and you end up with sun scald and some of these things happening. And a lot of people go, well, I, I have a lot of, uh, what about if my tomatoes start cracking? Well, cracking usually comes from the simple fact that it's been, there's not a consistent amount of water going back to tomato plants. You might have a week of dry weather and then all of a sudden you get a downpour of rain and tomatoes mainly grow at night. And what happens is, is that tomato grows and expands. The skin on it's done got kind of thick and tough and it'll actually split it. And then the tomato will ruin on you if you're not careful. And, you know, so you have to make sure that you water consistently in order to keep the, uh, the cracking and the splitting down. Uh, you will have some of what's called cat facing. Cat facing usually comes from, and it can be from a couple of different things, but nine times out of ten, it's from weather fluctuations and temperature. It'll be cold at night, warm in the day, cold at night, warm in the day, while the tomatoes are blooming, actually putting on little tomatoes. And you'll get some cat facing that way. Um, trying to go through some of the things in my mind here that you would end up blossom end rot can be caused by a couple of different things. It's an uh, inconsistent supply of calcium to that tomato, which goes back to uh, do you even have the calcium in the soil? And if you do, then in what form is it in the soil in? How can I do a quick fix? A quick fix was like I told you with the Tom's tablets, the cheap ones. That's a quick fix. You can actually spray it on the plant or you can spray it around the plant to get it in it uh, to help with blossom in rot and then, then consistent watering because if, if a plant gets irregular amounts of water, then it will cause blossom in rot just as much as not having any calcium at all. So you want to make sure that you get a consistency of about one inch a week water to a tomato plant on a regular basis. Now it don't have to be all at once. You can just do it periodically during the week. Uh, I do recommend an irrigation system if you can for tomato plants just for that simple reason um, of 
preventing blossom end rot and preventing uh, cracking and splitting and stuff like that. And if at all possible, if you live in the northern climate, you might want to consider, even here in the, in the southern climate, you might want to consider using some sort of black ground cover um, to keep weeds out of it and to keep the warm, to warm the temperature of the soil up, especially in the early spring. It'll cause you to get your tomato plants up healthier, faster, and get them growing um, better. And one of the reasons, let me mention this, that I like using the uh, reinforcement wire for tomato cages it's just a simple fact that when I put my little plants in the ground, if I go ahead and stick my cages over them, basically all I have to do is wrap some two foot high black plastic around that tomato cage and just kind of pin it together, uh, especially if it's still a little bit cool at night. And the, during the daytime, as that thing heats up, that plastic gets warm and it actually heats that soil up in there and at night, the heat from that soil is radiating up through that black plastic and actually keeps that plant a little bit warmer at night so that it doesn't actually get the uh, um, the cooler temperatures to slow it down. But now you want your temperatures on a tomato plant at night to be around 60 to 75 degrees in the early spring because what that does is it creates a sturdier, um, healthier uh, tomato plant. Now you want to also let the wind blow that stalk just a little bit because as the wind blows that stalk, it creates that stalk and makes it uh, more stocky and more sturdy, more able to withstand uh, the elements a little bit better. And guys, always be on the lookout for uh, insects that hit tomatoes. You have stink bugs um, that hits them pretty bad. They'll sting places all over your tomato plants. That's the reason we like to get them in in the early spring because a lot of times we can beat the stink bug uh, hatch off. Uh, tomato hornworms will attack tomatoes, they'll attack peppers, um, potatoes, anything in the nightshade family, those hornworms are just horrendous. And then you, uh, you get these little, little small worms that bore holes in the tomatoes, and they, you'll have to, the infestation of those, sometimes I have to get as many as hundreds of them off of one plant, because they'll hatch out just overnight. And you gotta, I have to sit there and hand pick them off. Now you can use, uh, you can use BT, uh, Bersilius thuringiensis, as a treatment. It's an organic pesticide if you so wish. Um, you can use some different other oils um, to spray on your plants to actually get rid of them. Uh, aphids is another thing that hits tomato plants you gotta kind of be cautious about. Uh, you got white flies that hit tomato plants. I mean, there are, tomato plants have a lot of pest problems. Um, but if you keep, we've learned this, if you keep a good, healthy plant you have less problems with insects than anything else. Uh, occasionally, we'll get a tomato hornworm off of ours. And if you find one, just keep looking because there's usually more than one somewhere in the area there. The other plants usually have more than one hatched out. And specifically on that one plant, there will probably be more than one. And as far as diseases, we've learned that the healthier that plant is, we have fewer problems with diseases, specifically if we keep those bottom leaves off on the indeterminate ones. And the determinate ones, if we can keep some kind of ground cover underneath them, we've learned that uh, we have less problem with, pro with, with you know, that way. Um, just trying to think if there's anything else here, guys, that we can, um, you know, mulching tomatoes is good. If you, uh, if you want to mulch your tomatoes, it helps to keep the, the soil uh, damper. Uh, they don't uh, go through the drying out and wet period quite so bad. It helps with the blossom end rot and the cracking if you can get a good mulch over it. Um, I do encourage that also. I mean, that's something you might want to consider. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else here that, um, that, we, that we do here that would be interesting on this video and help y'all out. So now, I do not overwater tomato plants when they're young because if you... Overwater tomato plants, then um, what happens is when you overwater them, they, they'll, especially if they're little, they'll damp off. But if you overwater them, even when they're large and the roots stay too wet, what happens? Those uh, tomato plants don't, the roots don't go out looking for water. I call it going looking for their groceries, you know. I'll usually water a little bit away from the plant. I don't water right up against the plant, maybe like two inches to one side of it if I've got drip irrigation 
or if I'm watering with a water hose, I just fill the middles of the rows up where the plant has to actually, the roots have to grow out to it. And when I fertilize, I never fertilize right up against the plant. I always fertilize out along the drip edge of the plant so that the roots have to go looking for their food source. I call it looking for their groceries. And it seems to make a more hardy plant that way because of a better root system on the plant. Now guys, I'm going to probably stop it right there because I think I've covered just about most of what I do to a tomato plant here at Deep South Homestead. Like I said, I don't go reading all these things from universities and stuff like that because if I did, I thought I told you in the beginning, I'd just be repeating what they said. So what I'm telling you on my videos is what I do is trial and error here at Deep South Homestead. Um, might not work for you, I don't know, but it works for me here at my homestead. I have a sandy loom soil. I don't have a packy soil or anything like that to contend with, but it's what works here for me. And want to keep your pH on your tomato plants. I know I didn't mention this in the beginning, but I did mention it in one of my prior videos that you want to keep the pH in the soil about 6.5 to 6.8. Tomatoes prefer a little bit more acidic than 6.8. 6.5 would be better. But um, other than that, I think I've just about covered everything. And I'm hoping that this video has helped y'all out a little bit about... Um, some of the ways that you can do tomatoes, some of the things about tomatoes, a um, little bit of their history maybe, and uh, what you can do if you have a problem. So, you know, maybe this has been a benefit to you. And if it has, you know, give me a thumbs up or share it with someone else or, or save it in your, you know, in your, in your folders over there. Put it over to the side so that next year when you grow tomatoes, pull it up, listen to it again, and just see if, uh, if there's something there that you might need to do. You know, so I hope it's been a blessing to you and thank y'all from Deep South Homestead.